Have you ever thought about this question? What should I do with my life? Well, your life is just an accumulation of days. So instead of answering the question, what, what should I do with my life? Which is a very, very big and tough question to answer. Think about how you want to spend your days. Because a good life is basically just a series of good days. So in this video, I'm going to show you how you can plan your day. Of course, there are many, many ways in which you can plan your day. That's totally up to you, but I'm just showing how I would go about it. So the first tip would be that you want to do daily habits more or less at the same time. In the book, The Power of Habit, Charles says that, that there are very, very many various triggers, but there are five triggers for habits that are especially common. And one of those five triggers is the time of the day when we do it. When you look at the habit loop, a habit consists of the trigger, the routine, and the reward. So if you want to actually build a good habit, you need to find a trigger. And one of those triggers could basically be the time of day when you do it. And the second reason why this is practical is that then you don't have to plan a new time each day. And that basically is very, very good against decision fatigue. The state in which you're confronted with so many different options in this case, thinking about, shall I do it now? Shall I do it later? Shall I do it at this time? Or shall I do it at that and that time? And this decision fatigue can be very, very tiring because when we make decisions, we use the prefrontal cortex and the prefrontal cortex uses up a lot of energy. And therefore, when we make very, very many decisions, we end up having less energy. So always doing it at the same time could mean that you've got more energy because you don't have to think about when you're going to do it over and over again. And then the second tip would be to have a morning ritual. What I like to do with my morning ritual is basically think of my intention, who I'd like to be and where I want my life or what I want to do with my life. And I find it very important to do it in the morning so that I don't um, find myself off track, forget about my intentions and then it's too late, I've already done this thing that I shouldn't have done. When it comes to morning routines, I would go for simplicity over complexity because complexity is the enemy of execution. The reason why morning rituals are so important is because if we start our day off well, doing something that's good for us, then this will have a domino effect and then throughout the day we will have more and more wins. And then throughout the day, we will do more and more actions that are good for us because we started off the day well. In James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, he explains it this way. If you start off your morning well, then you've already made so much more progress than if you had done something that's bad for you. Once you've done something that's bad for you, it takes more and more good things to have your day be as good as if it had been if you had started off well which you can see in this graph. It's very important that you don't start off your day in a distractive mode. For example, scrolling on over your phone because your morning basically sets you up for the rest of the day. So if you start off in a distracted mode, you're going to be distracted the rest of the day. And then the third tip would be to have an evening ritual. In your evening ritual, you want to make sure that you summarize all the things you've learned so far. And this is important because we remember most what happens at the end of the day. Also, before, right before we go to sleep, our brain is in this theta state, this state in which it's very, very easy for you to learn new things and to especially be very creative. For this very reason, uh, Thomas Edison, for example, would, before he'd go to bed, have a ball in his hand so that when he'd fall asleep, he dropped the ball and then wake up again so that he could work in a state where he was really, really good at being creative and very good at learning. Not only when it comes to our days, do we remember what happens at the end most. In general, it's always like that, that we always remember what happens at the very end the most. There are a couple of studies to back that up. So in this, so one study would be a study in which participants put their hands in cold water so much so that it would be painful. So the first round, they would put their hands into the water for 60 seconds and it would be 10 degrees Celsius. Then in the second round, 
it would also be 60 seconds with 10 degrees Celsius, except that then at the end they added 30 seconds and then the water was only 15 degrees Celsius. So in the second case, it was all in all 90 seconds of them putting their hands in cold water, but at the end the water was a little warmer than it was at the beginning. Whereas in the first round it was 60 seconds, but it was only the colder water. And then the participants had to choose between whether they'd rather repeat the first round, so the one with 60 seconds of 10 degrees Celsius cold water, or the second, or if they'd rather repeat the second one with 60 seconds of 10 degrees Celsius cold water, and then 30 seconds of 15 degrees Celsius cold water added on to that. Now, of course, logically speaking, it would be much less painful to go for the first round because yes, the water was cold all the time, but it only was so for 60 seconds. Whereas in the other round, it was actually basically the same, except that it was longer. But then in this period where it was longer, it was a little warmer. But since the participants only remembered that the water was warmer at the end, they thought it was warmer the whole time and therefore chose the second to do the second thing again. Although logically speaking, the first round would have been much less painful. So in another study, participants were split into two groups. So one group had to basically evaluate the life of someone who lived 60 years and then died due to a car accident. And in those 60 years, they had a great life. And then the second group had to evaluate life in which the first 60 years were identical to the other one. Just as great, just as wonderful. But in this scenario, the person wasn't driven over by a car, but lived 10 years longer. Just that then these last 10 years were still good, still wonderful, but not as great as the 60 years before that. And it turned out that the participants in the first group evaluated that life better, even though the other life was just as good, except that that person lived 10 years more and those 10 years then weren't as exciting, but still great. So there you see how we remember what happens at the very end the, very, uh, the most. So what I then like to do in my evening ritual is evaluate how well I've done, what I could have done better, summarise everything I've learnt, evaluate how much I've progressed compared to yesterday, measure the gain and not the gap. So the gain basically is how much you've improved since yesterday, whereas the gap is how far away you are from your ideal, your future self. And of course you want to make sure that you measure the gain more than the gap. So basically, I think if you want to improve yourself, the two things that are most important to know about yourself is to know where you stand and to know how you can improve. And then what I also like to do in the evening is to plan the next day. And then when you plan, and this would be the fourth tip, I would go about it in not writing in a vague way what you're going to do, for example, writing down from then then to then and then I am going to write my book or study for that and that subject because that subject is going to have so many topics and that book is going to be so long you're definitely not going to manage to do all of it today. And of course when you see that you should write a book or simply study that subject you feel overwhelmed. So I prefer writing down how many exercises I want to, for example, do in a certain subject or from which page to which page I'd like to learn that day. And then the fifth tip would be the rule of three. According to Jim Collins, author of Good to Great, if you have more than three priorities, you have none. So the rule of three basically is just having three things that you want to do the next day so that you stay focused. The best thing you could do is if if you could have one day in which you batch those kind of tasks, another day on which you batch those kind of tasks, other kinds of tasks and so forth. What you definitely want to avoid is task switching, 
or multitasking. So no one can really multitask. I think it's only 1% of the population who can actually do so. What multitasking basically actually is, is task switching. You can't do certain tasks at the same time. You can only switch your attention from one task to another task. And task switching is very, very tiring. It really taxes your brain a lot. Task switching is one of the most difficult things for your brain. When it comes to creative and productive tasks, these are very, very different when it comes to how our brain deals with such tasks. Because for the creative kind of tasks, we use what we call in neuroscience the bottom-up mechanism, whereas for productive ones, we use the top-down mechanism. So top-down mechanism basically is when you're, for example, using your prefrontal cortex and using the top-down mechanism for creative tasks is mostly subcortical regions, including your, ba including your basal ganglion. And since these two tasks are so different from one another, it would be good if you could on one day only do creative stuff and on the other day only do productive ones. As you can see, planning your day has a lot to do with time management. If you're interested in how to manage your time, you can watch this video here.